to the District Court of Guam. I'm Chuck White, the Chief Deputy here at the court. Let's get our tour started by going into the main courtroom. Come on in and just take a seat here in the gallery where the public usually sits when they're here to watch a public court hearing. After you take a seat, I'd like to explain the layout of the courtroom to you. First, let's start where the government, that's the United States, or the plaintiff, the person or parties that bring the case, where they sit. They sit right here. Opposite to them are more seats where the defendants or the persons or parties responding to the charges, along with their attorneys, sit. And over here on the side is the jury box where the jury sits during a trial. Usually we sit 12 jurors for a criminal trial plus up to four alternates. For a civil trial, a little bit less. And here's the witness bench where the witness who is being examined by the attorneys or questioned by the attorneys sit. And the judge, usually the chief judge, sits up here, up front, up high. Everyone can see her. And in front of her are the courtroom deputy clerk who organizes the logistics of each hearing and the court reporter who stenographically records the words spoken during the hearing. And here in the middle is the multimedia podium from which the attorneys argue their case or motion. And lastly, over here in the corner, is where the judge's law clerk sits. That's the attorney who assists the judge in researching and writing uh, orders. Let's talk about the court and courts in general. Courts, and especially trial courts like the District Court of Guam, are places where arguments are resolved. And people or parties argue about two types of things in this court. Number one, facts. Number two, the law. With respect to the law, matters relating to the Constitution of the United States and matters relating to laws passed by the Congress of the United States are argued. In the court next door, the judiciary of Guam, matters relating to laws passed by the Guam legislature are argued. In the District Court of Guam, several types of cases are argued. There's criminal cases, civil cases, bankruptcy cases, admiralty cases, and tax cases, just to name a few. For example, in a criminal case, the United States government charges a defendant with violating some U.S. criminal law or statute, and the defendant argues that he or she didn't violate that statute. And they argue over facts and law, and if it goes to trial, a jury of fellow citizens listens to the arguments and evidence and decides whether or not there is a reasonable doubt that the defendant violated that statute. Now, civil cases are not criminal cases, but are arguments over constitutional rights or sometimes contracts between a person or company based on Guam and another person or company who's not on Guam. Bankruptcy cases involve persons who, for one reason or another, have accrued way too much debt. And admiralty cases involve actions on the high seas around Guam. The District of Guam is one of 94 districts in the United States, and each has its own district court. Our court was created by the Organic Act of Guam in 1950, the same act that created the government of Guam. Those 94 districts, in turn, are grouped into more than a dozen circuits. Let's take a look at the map. Each one of the circuits has its own court of appeals. Now, I said that the District Court of Guam is a trial court where arguments are resolved. If one or more parties does not like the way their argument was resolved in our court, they can appeal it to a higher court, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And what happens if a party does not like the way that the Court of Appeals resolves the argument? They can file an appeal with the Supreme Court of the United States. Of course, the Supreme Court can decide not to entertain that appeal. The chief district judge of the court is Francis Tidinko Gatewood, who was nominated to the federal bench by President George W. Bush on April 25, 2006, and confirmed by the United States Senate 
on August 4th, 2006. And then in October 30th, 2006, she was sworn in as the chief judge of the District Court of Guam, becoming the nation's first Chamorro female judge. Our chief judge is only one of two judges out of the 94 chief judges in the United States who also sits as a bankruptcy judge. And pursuant to the Organic Act of Guam, district judges in this court serve a 10-year term and then continue to serve until the president of the United States either replaces them or renominates them. Now, some of the duties of our chief judge include managing the court's overall caseload, supervising trials, writing opinions, and presiding over lots of different types of cases, some of which I mentioned earlier. There's civil actions that arise under the Constitution, laws, and treaties of the United States. There's certain civil actions between citizens from different states. There's civil actions in which the United States of America is a party. There's civil actions within the admiralty or maritime jurisdiction of the United States surrounding Guam. And of course, there's criminal prosecutions brought by the United States, and this includes uh, jury trials. And as I mentioned before, uh, bankruptcy, tax, and admiralty cases. Our chief judge is also very uh, interested in community outreach and civics education. So you'll often see her and her team out in the community doing these things or conducting court tours, much like the one we're doing today. So at this time, let's go see our other judge, U.S. Magistrate Judge Michael Berdalio in his chambers. Here we are at Judge Berdalio's chambers. I think he's expecting us. Good morning, Your Honor. I've got a tour group here. Would you like to say some words to them? Thank you very much, Chuck. Buenas and half a day, everyone. My name is Michael Berdalio, and I am the magistrate judge here at the District Court of Guam. Um, prior to coming to the court, I served as a judge of general jurisdiction on the Superior Court, which is the local court, and moved over here to the District Court um, right before the pandemic in February 14, 2020. Uh, the duties of a magistrate judge are really to assist the uh, district court judge in handling uh, both civil and criminal cases, uh, but there is limited uh, power. Uh, primarily for criminal cases, I do all the initial appearances. Uh, that includes all the pretrial matters such as search warrants and arrest warrants. Uh, when a defendant is picked up, the initial appearance is usually before a magistrate judge. Um, if an arraignment is returned from the grand jury, I will take that. We will then schedule hearings uh, before the court. Uh, any bail motions usually are handled by the magistrate judge. Uh, but all matters handled by the magistrate judge are subject to uh, a review by the district court judge should either side wish to do that. Uh, in addition, uh, for criminal matters, uh, if the parties consent, the magistrate judge can handle change of pleas. Um, and then of course, uh, I generally handle all the supervision once a defendant has been uh, either found guilty and is on supervised release or has pled guilty pursuant to a plea agreement and is on supervised release. Um, any violations um, after the defendant is released from prison usually come to the magistrate judge first. I'll make my initial uh, recommendations and then they'll be forwarded to the chief judge uh, for their review, for her review and final decision on the matter. Uh, with respect to civil matters, um, the magistrate judge can handle almost all civil matters up to trial. Um, that is without the consent of the parties and uh, on assignment from the chief judge. If the parties consent, uh, then the magistrate judge, uh, then I can actually hear and try the civil matters to a conclusion and that becomes binding on the parties just as if uh, the chief judge had heard it. So those are kind of the duties that the magistrate uh, judge does here at the court. Um, <clears throat> And I have my own courtroom. I am allowed to do uh, certain jury trials for misdemeanors, uh, again, on the consent of the parties. Um, and that's it. Welcome to the court. Well, it's good. Thank you for uh, helping us out today. And we're going to go up and um, go visit some other folks. All right. Thank okay. you, Chuck. You and take care, uh, Your welcome Honor. Welcome to the uh, District Court of Guam, everyone. All right. 
Next stop on our tour is the jury administrator upstairs. Let's go. Well, hello everyone, come on in. Here we are we're with Lilani Hernandez, our jury administrator. Hi, Lani. Hey, Chuck, how are you? Can you tell the group here a little bit about what you do as jury administrator? Well, let's see, in a nutshell, um, as a jury administrator, or as the jury administ administrator here for the court, I basically manage the jury wheel. Um, qualified jurors, ensuring that there are enough jurors available when needed for a jury trial, and then when we do have jurors here in the courthouse, whether they are grand jurors or trial jurors, known as petite jurors, I just have to ensure that um, they're safe, secure, that their needs are met, and that they are comfortable while performing their duties as jurors for the court. That's it. That's good. What do you like most about that job? Um, interacting with the public. Um, it, it's nice to see what it feels like from their perspective, in a sense, you know, how they feel about the court. Um, when they first come in for selection as trial jurors and then when they leave their perspective more more times than than none changes because they have a better understanding of the legal system and um, the processes that are involved and one last question how long have you worked for the court oh gosh let me see 20 years 20 years very good. Yep. Well, thanks for talking to us. I think we'll go now and we'll talk to a case manager. Awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. And here we are visiting with Walter Tenorio, one of our case managers here at the court. Walt, I have a tour group with us, and we're going around the courthouse talking to people and visiting spaces. And we had to talk to someone who's been here a while and someone who does some pretty fundamental things for us. How long have you been here with us? I've been here with the court for over 20 years. Uh, I started in 2001 to present. 20 years. Yes. And what kind of things do you do for the court? Uh, my main job description is I am a case administrator too um, with case docketing on our ECF system. I'm also the magistrate judge's courtroom deputy and I'm also the property manager for all our properties that belong to the court inputting in the court system, keeping monitor of their movements, and having the proper documentations for each assignment. And I'm also the outgoing postman as part of my duties here in the courthouse. Did you mention jury administration? Oh, no, I did not. Thank you for mentioning it. I am also the assistant jury administration. So friends, you can see that here in the District Court of Guam, we have uh, a variety of people, not just lawyers. We have people of all kinds of backgrounds and skill sets to make this system of justice we have in the United States work. And Walt Tenorio here is, is a fine example of that. And uh, thank you, Walt. Thank right. you for being You're with us. Welcome. We're going to go on now and uh, probably go down to the U.S. Probation Office. All right. Thank you for having me. Sure. All right. Here we are at the U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services Office. Let's go see if the U.S. Probation Officer or her deputy's in. Well, we're here now with Jeffrey Ventura, United States Probation Officer. Jeff, I have a group with us. Uh, we're, we're just touring the court. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what your office does? Well, the Probation Office does quite a few things. Um, we have a hand in a couple of stages of the, the, the court process. The first part we, when we touch a case is at the pretrial stage. Uh, at that point, we do what's called bail reports for the judge and the court. Uh, those bail reports uh, focus on two general things. Uh, one is the safety of the community, depending on if the defendant is a danger to the community. And the second is to determine if the defendant is a, a flight risk. Um, when the defendant uh, appears in court for that initial appearance hearing, uh, we go over that bail report at that time. So that's the first stage where we, we have a hand in the court process. Um, as the, the, the case moves on and when the defendant is convicted or goes to trial or pleads guilty, we go through another process that we call a, a pre-sentence pre investigation report stage. That pre-sentence investigation report is more detailed, obviously. Uh, we provide those reports for the judge to determine a recommendation for, for that defendant. Uh, in that report, there are many things in that pre-sentence investigation report, which is, of course, confidential. A lot of things in that report, uh, we have... Uh, uh, federal statutes, uh, and we use the United States Sensing Guidelines to do some calculations. We also go through the defendant's uh, criminal history if that's 
because that's relevant in this case. And of course, another important portion of that is uh, the defendant's background and that personal history, and what affected that defendant to either commit the crime or influence the crime. So that's another part of the stage that we have a, a part in the court process. And of course, uh, we have our probation when the person comes out of the, the, the system, either they did a, a imprisonment term and we have another area of what we call supervised release. So when that person does come out on supervised release, we have other probation officers who monitor the defendant to make sure they're doing okay. And they have that transition process to reintegrate back into the, the population and the community. And you know, uh, we do a lot of drug testing, of course, if, the, if, that's, if that's an issue of the defendants when they come out. And we do a lot of other community service projects to make sure they're more involved. We help them with their education and uh, getting back, a, getting into a job situation, getting a job, um, uh, resume building is another thing too. And um, that's a huge thing which our office does. So as you can see, we have uh, a little multifacet of areas which we have a hand in. So that's the general and summary of what we do here at the probation office. Well, that's, uh, thank you so much. That sounds like uh, you guys play a very key role in this whole process and we don't want to forget that. Yes. Thank you for your time. We're going to head off right next door to the grand jury room and talk a little bit about indictments and things like that. Okay. Thanks so much. No problem. Bye-bye. Well, here we are at the nondescript door of the grand jury suite here at the district court, one of the most secret rooms in the entire building. Let's go in and I'll try to explain to you what I know about the grand jury. The Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution says that no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless a, on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury. A grand jury is a panel of 23 citizens who serve for a year, sometimes for a year and a half, meeting approximately once a week here in Guam. They hear evidence presented by an assistant United States attorney outside of the presence of a judge and then decide if there's a probable cause to issue an indictment against a person accused of a federal crime. An indictment is a formal charge returned when 12 or more of the 23 grand jurors vote in favor of it. And probable cause is a finding that persuades the grand jurors that a federal crime has probably been committed by the accused person. That is, that there is more evidence for the crime than against. At least 16 of the 23 grand jurors must be present for the vote, which is done in secret. And an indictment does not indicate that a person is guilty. That is decided by a jury during a trial, but it does serve to initiate or start a criminal case. Grand juries are meant to prevent scurrilous charges from being levied against people by the government. And the grand juries at the District Court of Guam meet here in this room during normal times. You can see here seats for 23 people, as well as for the assistant U.S. attorney presenting the evidence and their witnesses. And off to the side, you can see a service area or a small kitchen, as well as restrooms. And on the other side, you can see two small rooms for witnesses. Well, thank you for joining us today on our quick whirlwind tour of the district court. We hope you come back and see us sometime. If you do, stop by and say hi.